Ah, how we doing today, folks? It's uh, been a while since I put together an actual uh, video of me wandering through some habitats, looking at stuff. You know, I've been getting busy a little bit with work and such. But you know, I'm out here today in a lovely sand prairie, and we're just gonna be uh, we're just gonna be going through some of the species that we're seeing out here. You know, just gonna have a nice, lovely time. Look at some lovely, cool native stuff. Maybe I'll talk about some garbage invasives that we're seeing out here as well. But I don't know. Actually, hang on. I think I might see a velvet ant right now, which is a really cool little bug. Hey, are you a velvet ant down there? I hope you're not, because... Oh, God, it is. Oh, that's really cool. Sorry to uh, sorry to get distracted right out the get-go. These guys are just really, really neat. See that little guy running around right there? That's a velvet ant, you know? It's a, it's a kind of wingless wasp. They pack a real nasty punch. I was trying to maybe be a little bit careful. I'm pretty bad at my insects, though. You know, not an entomologist. Not really a botanist, either. Just... As I said before, just a jackass with a camera that likes flowers. But anyway, we'll get started nice and easy with a lovely member of the Asteraceae. Oh, God, there's a nice big hoverfly on there. Look at that, getting some native pollinator action. Oh, yeah. Well, what this guy is on right now is uh, Coreopsis lanceolata. That's the lance leaf tick seed. You know, obviously very identifiable by these, these nice lancelet leaves that you can see right here. Uh, Coreopsis, a little bit notable about that. You know, as you're going to see, I mean, a lot of these guys don't have the call line leaves, but... You know, because that is, but if you look down here at the base, you know, they got a couple of coline leaves, you know. You can see that it's got an opposite leaf arrangement, which is kind of characteristic for the, uh, for the Coreopsis. Another thing you're going to want to note, you're going to turn it around, get a load of those nice bracts subtending the inflorescence, you know. You're going to have eight little bracts, those little green guys right there, subtending the inflorescence. Very nice, lovely plant. As you can see, it's just loving the, uh, prairie out here. Remember the Asteraceae, as I said. Ah, let's go, uh... Let's go check out that, uh, that Tratoscantia. This guy right here, this is a Tratoscantia. Uh, we get a couple of different species in this area. This one is looking like, uh... Oh, yeah, but first, you know, get a load of that. Now, the way you distinguish this guy, this is Tratoscantia ochiensis, which, uh, the how I've arrived at that conclusion is basically, you know, I'm looking at these sepals, and in Tratoscantia ochiensis, the sepals, they're typically glabrous, which means hairless, or you'll see a tiny bit of hair right at the apex of the sepals, right at the tip, you know, but as you can see, these guys are totally glabrous, meaning that this is, of course, obviously, uh, Tratoscantia ochiensis, which is pretty nice, pretty lovely to see that, oh, yeah. Just got these, uh, you know, this is a monocot, of course, so you can see that nice, nice parallel venation there in the leaves, as well as the fact that we're dealing with a nice three-parted flower right here, I believe. Let me feel you. Ooh, that's a bit coarse. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is not the endemic lithospermum. Also, you know, judging by the larger size of the flowers, this right here is lithospermum carolinens, you know, which is uh, in the Baraginaceae, as you can kind of tell from these... Uh, these sort of cyme inflorescences that it's got going on, you know? You can kind of see the scorpioid cyme type. De Actually, you can see it really well right there on that head. You can kind of see how the flowers are arranged in a little bit of like a scorpion's tail fashion, you know? M giving rise to the name of a uh, scorpioid cyme, you know? Pretty descriptive. Nice and hairy, as you often get in the Baraginaceae. And right here at my knees, I've got our, I've got our uh, lovely native Opuntia getting ready to bloom. Look at these buds getting ready. Uh, now... I've had some troubles with the opunches in the past because I was calling them humifusa, but then I read a paper which said that if the uh, the plant had spines rather than glockids, oh shit, I got glockids in my hands. All right, but you see this thing that I'm touching right now. Now that's an actual spine, you know, which is different from your typical glockids, which are those little those little orange like fiberglass looking things that are all jutting out of there. You know, you get them in your hand, you get a nasty blister, it explodes, there's a bunch of pus everywhere. It's pretty gross. But anyway, that spine is a diagnostic factor, which is leading me to call this, um, probably Opuntia macrorhiza, uh, or Opuntia cespitosa. Not 100% sure, definitely an Opuntia of some variety, because that's really, I mean, that's the only cactus we get around here native. But you know, it's a lovely guy. But you see, it's just so cool to see all this native stuff going off. You know, it's just, uh, it's glorious. But, you know, even with this, uh, you know, so it's a nice high-quality ecosystem that we're in. I'm kind of running my mouth real quick here. This is going to be nice and disorganized because I'm real caffeinated. Uh, and, you know, we're just going to just gonna see what else we got. There's a pretty, this guy's a nasty sucker right here. This big, big, big shrub right here. Uh, this is, yeah, I could tell. All right, yeah. This is the multiflora rose. You know, this is our invasive rose that we got from, uh, 
believe it's native to Japan. I want to say it's probably native to some other countries in East Asia, but it's definitely definitely doesn't belong in North America. You know, it's a uh, it's an invader. When you know the racists start talking about oh immigrants are coming and stealing our jobs, what they what they don't actually mean just like poor people that are trying to work, uh, getting paid like a dollar an hour to pick fruit for you know twelve hours underneath a blazing sun. Those are the lazy immigrants, by the way, that do that. Um, you know, they're actually talking about this guy. This guy's actually the one that's coming over to steal our jobs, you know, uh, and the jobs of the native plants. Obviously, immigrants don't steal jobs. Also, immigrants don't suppress wages. Bosses do. Anyway, moving on. Now, you know, since there was a velvet ant at the start, and now there's this nice little paper wasp hanging out on this sign, uh, you know, I just want to make a, I just want to make a nice little PSA. A little, a little wasp PSA. Uh, wasps, you know, wasps aren't bad bugs, you know. Wasps are, in terms of the ecological s services that they are provide, they are just as useful, if not more useful than bees, because wasps actually engage in other services other than pollination you know wasps do get into pollination a lot of the time but they also get into some uh, some other pretty pretty important behaviors such as you know predation and parasitism you know so basically what I'm trying to get across is that wasps are not bad okay yeah they get a little bit upset when you start fucking around with them but I mean so do you so uh you know, I don't know. They're just, uh, wasps are important. Wasps, is, uh, they deserve just as much love as bees, I guess. You know, in my heavily biased opinion. But, uh, there's a whole bunch of nice little stuff right in through this area. So let's, uh, let's chat about that, shall we? What we've got right here is the, uh, this is the prairie flocks. This is, uh, oh, God, I always mix these two species up just because the names are so similar. This is either Flux pumilla or Flux pulosa. Uh, not 100% sure, but you know, I'll double check my work and write it up. As you can tell in the Flux family, because you know, you got those nice, nice five petal Corollas, very salver form, which means tubular. You know, you can see. See how that's like a little tube? Also within the Flux is the, uh, the Polymoniaceae. You often get this opposite leaf arrangement, you know. There you go, pretty nice, very identifiable. Ah, lovely little guy right there. There's a whole bunch of it. Also, we've got a native rose, which I do love to see. I'm pretty bad at my roses because I'm pretty bad at, uh, I mean, a lot of groups of plants because I'm not a botanical expert. I'm just, well, I'm just an idiot with a camera. But I believe this is Rosa, this is Rosa Carolina or Rosa, Ar oh, geez. Well, I mean, these guys are going to seed right now, so I didn't actually break this one. Sorry about that, though, nonetheless. But this is Rosa Arkansana or Rosa, Rosa Carolina. Not too sure, gonna have to double check on it. But a lovely, lovely rose. Of course, a member of the rosaceae going off in this this nice little opening, you know. It's just uh oh god, it's so lovely to see all the all the all these native flora, you know? Just having a real banger time, even though uh I mean they're right next to actually like a uh right next to some kind of plant of some sort. Not like a uh not like, you know, you know, like a, like a factory type deal, you know, not like a, oh well, yeah, these plants are right by an actual, you know, they're right by a plant. Yeah, no shit, I'm in the middle of a prairie, there's plants everywhere. Anyway, but yeah, get a load of those nice roses, huh? Pretty sure. Hmm. Oh, God, they're so pretty. Nice and variable, too. Ah, yeah. God. Who doesn't love a good, a good native rose? If you plant multiflora rose in your garden at home, I'm going to come there, I'm going to cut it down, dig it up, and put one of these guys in there. And I'm also going to leave a very nasty note that says that you shouldn't have done this. Yada, 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 you get the deal, don't plant. Oh, look at that! Look at that, look at this. We got a, we got a freak, a freaky flox. Ooh, a mutant. Oh, God. The variation on these. Ah, they look so different, but they're all the same. Uh -huh. It's so cool. Don't you love that? It's just like people, they look different, but they're all the same at the end of the day, you know? We're all just meat bags. Uh, you know? Ah, yeah. Pretty nice. This is a bunch of Leucanthemum of some variety. What species is this? I think this is Leucanthemum maximum. Don't believe that's a native one. It's pretty weedy, you know? Nice little big daisy. I think the pollinators can get some action off of it, though, which is, you know, that's good. Pollinators like wasps. You know, you can't forget about the wasps when we're talking pollinators. Wasps are important, native stuff's good, invasives are bad. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm covering all the bases. It's very, uh, very sporadic and jumpy, perhaps, but, uh, I would advise you to get over it, because this is just kind of how I talk, you know? So I've kind of, kind of stepped into a bit more of a woodland edge, and I've got, uh, got our, one of my favorite ferns that we're looking at right here. This is Botrypus virginiana. The rattlesnake fern. They call it that because it apparently, uh, it's got, you know, it shares its habitat with rattlesnakes. And, you know, we do get a rattlesnake in Indiana. The, uh, 
the Massasauga, which is, you know, it's a very cute little snake. I saw one in the terrarium once. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, they're endangered in the state, so I'm probably not going to run into that, uh, you know. But anyway, Botrypis virginiana. This is a pretty cool fern because it does this thing where, you know, you get the uh, you get the, fer the sterile fronds right here, these green ones, these nice guys right here. Now, these all serve the purpose of photosynthesis, okay? So you're probably asking, what the hell is this? Well, this is the fertile frond, okay? It's a modified sporophyll, which means that this guy's loaded up with spores. So basically, this fern's feeling pretty frisky right now, and he's letting all the uh, letting all the uh, letting all the spores out. And you're gonna see that once I do that. Did you see that? See that little dust? See that little dust? There's some dust. And it, you're gonna have to trust me. There's dust. I just hope that guy. You know what? Actually, that was kind of dirty. Don't think too much about what I just did to that plant. But you know, there's a couple of them throughout this whole same area. And you know, it's pretty cool to see because I don't really, uh, you know, ferns are pretty great. They're a very uh, ancient lineage of plants. You know, those being the uh, the vascular, non-flowering plants. Oh yeah. But yeah, I just had to show you guys that pretty cool little fern right quick. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We'll get back into the prairie, you know, and see what we can really see. What other stunners we can run across? Yeah. Oh, look at that. These guys are getting ready to explode. Oh man. This right here is of course, this is a milkweed that we're looking at right now. You could probably tell by the nice, the nice opposite leaves and the very characteristic cluster of f flowers that they get. This is Asclepius tuberosa, which they call the butterfly milkweed, which is in my opinion kind of a dumb name because you know, all the milkweeds are going to attract a lot of pollinators, you know. I don't really like it too much, you know, but this guy's, uh, you know, that aside, it's a very lovely plant. I'm hoping to see one of these in bloom. It's distinguishable from the other milkweeds because, you know, it's got this kind of lower, or the milkweeds in our area, that is, because it's got this kind of sprawling habit, you know, that you can see here. It's just kind of freaking out. There's a whole bunch of them around this area. Not really freaking out, but just, just really hanging out, you know. It's, it's a nice casual milkweed, you know. He's not standing up straight trying to impress anyone. He's just being comfortable, you know. Just hanging out, getting ready to bloom, and uh, offer some lovely services to the pollinators. And then, you know, set some more seed and produce a whole bunch more of this uh, excellent-looking native plant. Maybe I can actually find one of these in flower. I believe I'm a bit early on this one, though, because this is the uh, this is the farthest along in the uh, phenology that I've seen this plant out here. Maybe we'll see one open up. Probably not, though. Again, moral punches here. I got to be kind of careful so I don't accidentally stab myself. Ah, uh, what else do we got? What do we got? Mmm. Of course, we've got a whole bunch of those coreopsises that I mentioned at the start. I was looking for another member of the aster family, a uh, a pacara which is another smaller yellow flower and so I guess I'm gonna have to uh, I guess I'm gonna have to go look around and uh, try to find the Pacaras to show you because those are also uh, also pretty cute oh yeah nice ah so I found my uh, found my Pacaras you know but I've also found this lovely guy this is a uh, some species of anemone in the ranunculaceae I believe it might be it doesn't quite look like a anemone virginiana I'm gonna have to key these out but, you know, that's the good thing, you know, you're going to be learning. But, you know, important while you're keying stuff out, you want to be taking notes about all the features of the plant, you know. You want to, of course, be taking note of the fact that this guy's got an awfully pubescent leaf surface, you know. Also, these flowers aren't quite open yet, but you can kind of see right there. You don't have any sepals. So what we're dealing with is, of course, being in the ranunculaceae, sometimes you don't have sepals, but you do get the petaloid sepals on them, you know, like in that, uh, like your marsh marigold calthopalustris, you know. But also, let's get a load of these, uh, these nice little lovely senecios. It's a whole, it's a real, uh, this video is another real aster show because, uh, oh my god. Did you see that tiny little frog? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Move this leaf real gentle like. He's right there. Come on, come here. Come on, come on, come on. No, come on. Let me show you to the world. Are you in here? God, missed it. Anyway, that's regrettable. Don't really know what kind of frog that was. Pretty cute though. Anyway, this guy right here, this is Pacara. Let me see. Yeah, this is Pacara platensis. You know, Pacara platensis, it's the prairie, uh, the prairie Pacara. You know, kind of diagnostic on it, though, is if you look at it real close, you can kind of see this kind of, like, cobwebby filament, you know? That kind of pubescence, that's a dead giveaway, along with the, uh, along with the habitat. But just a lovely, lovely member of the Asteraceae. You're going to, of course, turn it around. You know, you're going to see one series of bracts. It's very important to look at the bracts when you're dealing with the Asteraceae because a lot of the times when you're just staring at flowers that look like this, 
I mean, this looks like the tick seed, like a lot. But, you know, of course, this guy's got a lot more ray florets, you know. Uh, it's also got multiple heads on the flower. And, you know, the bracts are also totally different, you know. So basically, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, very important to be taking notes about the fine details. Ah, oh, yeah. Don't you just love that? Gotta love a good packer. Ah, oh, yeah. Ouch. What was that? I don't know. Anyway, pretty chaotic, pretty fun. Gotta enjoy it. Embrace the chaos, you know. Don't try to hide from it. You know, it's all fine. So, uh, just letting you guys know, I have, I have done some work on this rose here. And I believe that it is, in fact, Rosa Carolina. Uh, I came to that conclusion based on the number of the leaflets that you're seeing here. You're usually working with like five to seven. And also on the, uh, on the stem, you can see there the prickles. By the way, roses don't actually have technical thorns, as they're uh, termed in botany. They're uh, prickles. So remember that and that song, uh, Every Rose Has Its Thorns, you know. It's actually, uh, it's actually a load of unscientific hogwash. But anyway, Rosa Carolina. So, you know, you got that, you got, of course, that lovely flower. It's pretty variable. It likes the drier, sandy soils. And you've got those kind of slender, straight prickles all across the stem, which is very diagnostic, you know. Ran some stuff through a key, you know. Got to learn how to key stuff out because, you know, a lot of the times when you start dealing with stuff like roses, uh, there's a lot of them. And also with asters and, you know, oh, God. You know, you just got to, you know, if you really want to be, really want to be getting into all this stuff, you got to be... You got to be doing it right and not just looking at the flowers because, I mean, if you simply look at the flowers, you're going to be mixing up stuff left and right, which is obviously something that you, uh, something that you don't want to be doing. So that's what the, that's what the deal is with that rose, Rose of Carolina. In fact, it's what I believe I'm seeing out here. This guy, this is, get the hell out of here. This is Melolotus Alba. This guy's in the Fabaceae. It's a clover. You know, you can actually see it's got the, uh, Got the characteristic pea flowers with the banner wings and the keel and whatnot. Melolotus officinalis, people plant it a lot because uh, cause the bees like it, I guess, and you can make honey with it, but I don't think honey's worth ecological degradation, you know? Uh, yeah, but that's in the Fabaceae. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm just, uh, God, this is just such a nice ecosystem. And you can see all those little yellow Coreopsis heads, you know? Some of those are, of course, actually, uh, they're lithospermins, but, you know, they look like coreopsises from here, so we're just going to say, yeah, you know, a big mix, big lovely mix of the nice yellow flowers. Oh, yeah, there we go. Here's one of those anemones. Ah, oh, look at that. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, this is not, ah, uh, maybe this is anemone virginiana. The tall thimbleweed, perhaps. I actually think it might be. Ah, God, I'm going to have to key that out. You know, ah, you know, I'm going to be saying, you're going to see, you're going to hear me say that, you know? Uh, I'm sorry, like, I don't know, I don't know what you want. If you want someone that's an expert that, you know, knows everything about everything, uh, you know, I'm not your guy. Like, I mean, I'm learning just as much as anyone else is, you know? You know, it's good, you know? Keep that in mind. Everyone's learning. Be humble. Don't be a jackass. Pay attention to lovely stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see what else we got. Oh, man. This guy's real neat. I love this character right here. This guy's in the, uh, this guy's in the Fabaceae. And, you know, you can probably tell that a little bit, you know, because you're kind of seeing some of the, uh, the compound leaves, which are very characteristic of the Fabaceae. But also, just take note, look at how goddamn, uh, densely pubescent this guy is, huh? Pretty nice. This is the, uh, this is the lead plant. Uh, Amorphocanescens, you know, and it gets that Latin name as a result of this, uh, this densely canescent fuzz that covers all the surfaces. I'm touching it, it feels really nice. I would like, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you want someone to come around and say, hey, you know, maybe they boss you around, smack you around with one of these. I don't know. Whatever you're into, as long as you're consensual, you know? Gotta say that stuff. You know, it's very important, you know? And if you think it's not, fuck off, I don't want to talk to you. Um, also, right, this guy. Uh, this is, uh, Crigia virginiana. You know, the, uh, the dwarf dandelions, I call them. You know, because the common name is the dwarf dandelion. But, you know, I think it's cuter when I just smash those words together and make a nice little portmanteau out of them. You know, it's fun. Common names aren't real. Just call them whatever you want. You know the scientific names so that you can talk about them with, uh, with other people, you know? Yeah? Oh, yeah. God. Don't you just love when I show you guys actual flowers instead of just, like, stuff that's in bud and sedges? Yeah, that's pretty nice. Oh, God. What a day! Uh, this is something that I think personally is a little bit sad, actually. Because I'm looking at a bunch of these very lovely milkweeds right here. This is, I believe, by the way, this appears to be Asclepius amplexicollis. Judging by this, this, look at how undulating these leaf margins are. You see that? Look at that. 
Ah, yeah, not going to see that in a common milkweed. And then, of course, get up in there and look at those nice milkweed buds. Oh, yeah. Don't you like that? Uh, Asclepius amplexicollis, they call it the, uh, the sand milkweed or the clasping milkweed because you don't kind of clasp at the base like that. It's a very, very lovely plant, but unfortunately, a lot of the guys right here in this area, they don't appear to be doing too well. I don't know if that's something, something's up with like the soil here, but unfortunately, these big stupid honeysuckle bushes in the same area, they're doing fine while this lovely, this lovely native guy is unfortunately languishing. Don't like that. I don't like that, you know? I don't like it when the honeysuckle lives and the Asclepius dies, you know? It's just not the, it's just not the native way. I mean, unless, of course, you are dealing with some of the, uh, you know, there are actually, there are native honeysuckles. There are native members in the Lanicera who are okay to plant, you know? There's, uh, oh, God, what's that guy's name? Lanicera sempervirens, Lanicera orbiculatus. Those guys are good. Look at those. Oh, my God. I'm just a tiny bit early. Oh, that's unfortunate. Oh, man. God, I love milkweeds. Asclepius is such a cool goddamn genus. The entire Aposinaceae is just a really, really cool family. You know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just, uh, just hanging out around a massive milkweed right now. We got ourselves a little... A silver-spotted skipper right there. Some kind of native bee. This guy, this guy's a little dumbass. He's not going to be able to pollinate this effectively. Now, I'm not 100% sure what species this Asclepius is. I am going to have to key it out. You know, I think this might actually just be, this might actually just be Syriaca. But I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but what this does provide me is a very good chance to talk about the, uh, the Asclepius floral morphology, which is really, really complicated, and it's uh, really, really cool. So basically, in the Asclepiuses, okay, what you're normally going to be dealing with is, of course, a nice big, uh, nice big umbel, you know, shaped like a uh, half a circle, basically. And so, and then you actually got to look in on these flowers, okay? So first of all, you've got, you see right here, these guys that are bent back, you know, those are your sepals, okay? And now, and now that we got the sepals out of the way we can start to get into the really, really cool stuff about the, uh, the Asclepius morphology. So what we've got right there, these little white structures, you've got the hood and the horn, okay? So the, uh, the horn is what's jutting out of the hood. Sorry, I'm shaky, the caffeine, remember? And the horn is like that little claw, you know? And down in there is where the actual nectar is, okay? So that's where the bug's gonna stick his little proboscis to try to get a nice sugary snack. And then that white thing in the center, oh my god, I'm freaking out over here. That white thing in the center is, of course, the gynoecium, which is where the, uh, the reproductive structures are housed. And actually, if you look right in this guy, he's got a tiny little monarch on there. I didn't even notice ya. Oh, you're just hanging out there being real cute, huh? Oh yeah, in this lovely big Asclepius. Oh, there's a few of them. These aren't monarchs. Are these just really, I think these, are they? I don't, I guess I've just never seen them in this instar, huh? That's neat, but anyway, so the, uh, so anyway, we've got, we've bang, we've banged through a whole bunch of it. So we've got the sepals, the ho the hoods, the horns, and the gynoecium. And now it's really cool, and I gotta, gotta, just gonna take one. Just gonna take one. So, what we got right here. You see that little slit right there? Now that is what the, uh, that's known as the stigmatic slit. So in milkweed pollination, what occurs is, is that a bug's leg will go right through that little slit, okay? And it goes in there, and it'll pick up a structure called a pollinia, which has a, uh, has, well, it'll pick up the pollinia, and a pollinia is basically just an aggregated mass of pollen. It's a bunch of pollen grains all in one. And the structure that attaches to the pollinator's leg, it's called a uh, corpusculum, I believe, shaped like a... Uh, Kind of like a little sticky boomerang, and it just attaches to the uh, attaches to the bug's leg, and then it pulls it out. Now the problem is, though, is that in order to get your leg in there, you got to be a pretty big insect. Like we're talking like a bumblebee, probably, or a larger butterfly. And this is why I said that that one little uh, that one little native bee on there, which looked like uh, I I don't know my bees well enough to even randomly guess. Honestly, maybe like a seratina. I don't know. But you know, so basically what can happen to some insects is when they get their legs stuck in that stigmatic slit, if it's not a big enough insect, uh, it's going to have to rip its own goddamn leg off. 
which uh, you know is not very pleasant, but it does beat the uh, does beat the alternative, which is of course uh, you know dying while being attached to just a, a gorgeous flower like this milkweed. God, this is really man. This thing's lovely. But yeah, so just a just a very very cool and unique floral morphology. Uh, again, if you're looking for a much better one uh, on the milkweeds, Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't has a video about the milkweeds. Check it out. It's gonna be better than this. But I just thought that we'd uh, just take a gander at that, cause God, that's lovely. I'm gonna have to key this guy out. This guy might be Syriaca, honestly, cause we've got some tomentose fuzz on both surfaces of the leaves. We've got the uh, oh God, these hemispheric ah oh, jeez. God, the milkweeds, huh? The Asclepius. We had, had quite a few of those. So we had Amplexicolis, you know, we had the Tuberosa, and then we got this guy who I'm going to have to key out later. Uh, yeah, just a massive plant, though. Absolutely gorgeous. Covered in some nice downy pubescence all over the place. Oh, yeah. Get a load of that. Now, there's another, like, roadside place that I'm going to check out, and I'm probably going to run into some more sand prairie plants. So, uh... Let's go jump over there, I guess. Uh, yeah, hope you like the milkweeds. So like I said, I had to do a, do a stop by on this nice little spot right by the uh, side of the road, but I'm really glad I parked where I did because I think that this right here is some sort of orchid. Not 100% sure, but it's giving me some pretty orchidaceous uh, signals. You know, we got some nice nice bracts subtending the little flower buds. We got that nice parallel venation. And what we've also got right next to the park place that I parked is uh, this guy. And I'm pretty sure what we have right here is a native honeysuckle. Remember, I did say that there are some. I'm not too sure, but so yeah, I'm going to have to be doing work on those. Man, it's just... <sighs> You know, I mean, you just step, you just, like, literally, I just parked, parked the goddamn car and I almost hit, a, hit an orchid. This is, God, what, what the hell? Oh, man, what an awesome world we live in. Oh, man, maybe I'm going to go look in there for some orchids, maybe, but there are the sand prairie things that I wanted to check out on the other side of the road, and then I'll probably try to find an orchid or some shit, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. I don't really plan these things out, I just kind of show up and look at the plants and talk about them. Drop the phone there, all right, cool, let's, uh, let's go check out the actual sand prairie thing that I wanted to look at. So on the roadside here, it's actually, like, the plants out there, they're not really, uh, there's nothing too special. It's a lot of the same stuff that we've already seen. But I've also run into some stuff that I just, I just don't even know, man. Like, this guy right here looks like a sumac, some kind of roost. But I've never seen a sumac putting out bristles like this in my life. Like, when I, when I was first walking up to this, I thought that it was poison sumac at first. Because, you know, poison sumac's got that characteristic red midvein. I'm also keeping my hands away from it. Because I don't know if this guy's got a ruchiol on him or not. Leaf surfaces are kind of shiny, and it's giving me sumac vibes. So, you know, not too sure. You like how I throw the word vibe around like that? Like I'm a jackass? Do you like it? It's funny, I think. I have no idea what this is. God, that's cool, though. Oh, man. And there's another... There was a little one that I'm looking for. Jeez. Kinda. Is this a? Wait a minute. Oh no! I know what you are. This is bristly acacia. This isn't. Ah oh, shit. Okay, this isn't cool at all. Actually, this is. This is a. This is a junk invasive, and it and it fooled me. You know, because I started. I started seeing the fruits. You know, look at those fruits. They look like legumes. You know. Because they are legumes, because this guy's in the Fabaceae. I know it's I know its common name is bristly acacia. I know it's an invasive, which makes sense because I am on a roadside, a heavily disturbed an area. So you're not gonna yeah, it makes sense. Ah. Kind of a bummer, you know. Sometimes you can hear the wheels turning in my head when I'm doing these videos. It's pretty I hope you think it's fun. I uh you know, but you might not. I don't I don't know. You know, do yeah, sure. Why not? I don't know. Where's that little blue guy? There was this little flower that I saw out here that I didn't recognize, and I said, oh, well, I'll just come back to it later, you know, because I'll be able to find it. And now I am having problems doing that. So we've got a, uh, I mean, this guy right here, here's a nice one. This is Verbena, Verbena stricta in the Vervain family, I believe. Uh, so that's a pretty nice little native guy, kind of weedy, a little bit redderal. And this is the guy that I was trying to locate. Uh, upon closer inspection of the inflorescences, it appears as though I am dealing with yet another member of the goddamn Fabaceae, because I always am. Uh, yeah, and I don't really... Again, gonna have to key it out, man. I... 
I don't know how many times I've said that, and I'm going to repeat myself again if I manage to find one of those orchids in bloom, because I'm just, I don't know, man, I'm not an expert, I'm just a, just some guy, you know, but this one doesn't actually have compound leaves, which is kind of nice, it's got some kind of linear, linear lancelet, I call that, little pink flowers with the banner wings and the keel, more milkweeds, more Asclepius, uh, there's, uh, there's some Rebeccias right here, nice, the brown-eyed Susans, pretty nice. So, you know, there's some cute native stuff, and but honestly, I'm, I'm just itching to get the hell out of here and go get attacked by mosquitoes so I can itch more, but also possibly find an orchid. You know, because we're going to be... The stuff I'm about to do is not anything like sand prairie. It's, it's a wetland, you know. So we're going to do a real hard jarring gear shift because Nate needs to find his orchids. So uh, hanging, on the, hanging out on the roadside, a little bit perplexed. We've got some, uh, some lovely flowers that I'm around. This guy's a member of the... Uh, the Nictagenaceae family, the uh, four o'clock group. And there's a bunch of cars that are gonna pass me, might yell something offensive, but this is looking like Mirabilis of some species. Anyway, in the four o'clock family. Now, what we've also got throughout this same area, which is really very peculiar in my opinion, uh, is a couple of these orchids through here. The orchids only appear to be occurring on this side of the road. I've done a pretty thorough check of the area around here, the surrounding woods and stuff. And I managed to not find any of them, except growing in this roadside, uh, it's really quite a shitty environment that these guys are in, actually. Uh, hang on, let me find a couple of them. They're, they're, here we go, here's some good ones. Just position myself a bit away from the road. But yeah, so I've only seen these guys on the roadside here, but every bone in my body is telling me that this is, in fact, some species of orchid. You know? I'm not 100% sure which. I've got a book on the orchids of Indiana that I'm going to have to leaf through, you know, uh, judging by the blooming time and the county that I'm in. But, you know, I just... I don't know, man. It's just really, really weird. Because, you know, orchids, they're really kind of... They're kind of particular about their habitats because they have to, uh, in order to germinate, they have to have, like, a mycorrhizal association with the fungi in the ground to get them going. And this soil that uh, we're in right here is shit. <laughs> like this isn't high quality at all this is pretty disturbed i saw a lot of the uh the invasive bittersweet through here a lot of uh toxic adendron radicans poison ivy a lot of this guy the parthenocystis kinkafolia so i'm in not a high quality environment the mirabilis is pretty nice though by the way but yeah but still nonetheless we've got ourselves this wonderful orchid of some species which is really quite something to see i wasn't expecting that no. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's, uh, that's gonna be it for me. Uh, you know, roadside orchids, freaky phloxes, and a whole bunch of asters, folks. Uh, yeah, there'll probably be a little update, and there'll be a thing in the video about the species if I figure it out. Otherwise, it'll just bother me forever, and I'll never be able to forget it. Uh, yeah. Oh, look at that. That's really cool. Here we go. We got Smilax lazy on Nura going off on this roadside, too. The carrion flower. If you see this, uh, see this guy growing, you should definitely smell it. You know, it's very... Don't actually smell it. It smells like a dead body. Smilax, carrion flower, m mainly pollinated by flies. You know, pretty cool, though. Pretty cool, though. It's a dioecious plant, you know? So it's got male and female plants. Very nice. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, have a good one. Be safe. Uh, yeah.